Uh -huh. you do. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I uh, will now call the December 29th meeting of the Board of Regents to order. And we will begin today's meeting by recognizing our outgoing Vice President of Human Resources, Kathy Brown. President Gable, would you please join me at the podium? I want to begin by, as president, extending profound gratitude to Kathy Brown on behalf of the university for her service as the vice president for the Office of Human Resources, and also extend my personal appreciation to Kathy for her work as my partner during my transition and in my first six months as president, which has included already some notable moments. But I'll go back to the beginning. Kathy has held a number of key administrative leadership positions at the University of Minnesota for nearly 28 years. She's been a valued leader, a committed university citizen, and for many of us, a very good friend. Kathy came to the university after serving as a practicing attorney in Columbus, Ohio. From 1992 to 1999, she served as Associate General Counsel in the Office of the General Counsel. Kathy then became director of the Office of Disability Services for a year before being named an associate vice president in the Office for Multicultural and Academic Affairs from 2000 to 2002. In 2002, Kathy had been asked to serve as associate vice provost in the Office of Student Affairs. However, then President Udoff had announced his resignation and she was asked instead to serve as interim vice president and chief of staff for then interim vice president Bob Brunix. Everyone wanted her. When Bob Brunix was named president, Kathy stayed on as his vice president and chief of staff and supported the president's agenda, including the development of comprehensive strategic positioning efforts, the opening of a new on-campus football stadium, and a new university administrative policy framework that's still in place today, and that's just to name a few. Kathy became Vice President for Human Resources in 2011, serving as a champion for the strategic contributions and impact of human resources on the institution. And one I'd like to highlight in particular is her strong engagement in the AAU's Chief Human Resource Officers Organization, an organization where she served as president in 2018. In addition to professional accolades, we all know Kathy for her loyalty, her warmth, her calm presence, her strategic thinking, and her sense of humor. And Kathy, I thank you and we thank you for your incredible service to this university and wish you the very best in everything you set your mind to, any of which would be very lucky to have your attention. So I'll now ask Chair Powell to present to you a certificate of recognition. Thank you, uh, President Gable. And I, I would just like to read uh, this uh, Certificate of Recognition honoring Catherine F. Brown. The Regents of the University of Minnesota recognize with sincere gratitude and appreciation the exceptional dedication, service, and contributions of Catherine F. Brown, Vice President for Human Resources. As Vice President for Human Resources, Brown spearheaded a number of strategic initiatives, including but not limited to the de development of a vision and strategic plan for the Office of Human Resources, a reimagined employee engagement survey and action plan process that led to high response rates, and a new human resources analytics function designed to inform decision making. Brown served the university for nearly 28 years, first joining the university in 1992 as an associate general counsel in the office of the general counsel. During her tenure at the university, she served in a number of leadership roles including Interim Director, Office of Disability Services, Associate Vice President in the Office of Multicultural and Academic Affairs, Vice President and Chief, Chief of Staff for the President, and then as Vice President of Human Resources. Her significant impact on the University of Minnesota will be felt for decades to come. On behalf of the university community, the Regents extend their respect and deepest gratitude to Kathy Brown for her outstanding service to the University of Minnesota. And we wish her all the best in her future endeavors. Thank you. 
you. Never ask an attorney if they'd like to say a few words. <laughs> the wonder of the University of Minnesota is in its people, its faculty, its staff, its students, and they're remarkable. Um, we could go on and on about the many stories of wonderful things that happen here. I am full of gratitude for the opportunity that I've had over this past 28 years to work with so many of you in this room and many others across campus over that period of time. I'm also full of gratitude for the professional opportunities I have, have had here, which are frankly unequaled, um, just great. Um, my dad said to me once time, you're having a little trouble holding the job though, listen to all those different titles. <laughs> but anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. And at the end, there is great joy in working for a place that has a marching band. Thank you. <laughs>
I participated in a women in leadership panel on water and wild rice at White Earth Nation. We had a moment to establish an important dialogue that was hosted by the Humphrey School's Native Nation flag event, and we've named Professor Tad Johnson as our new Senior Director of American Indian Tribal <laughs> Relations, which is a system role, excuse me. We're engaging also with our higher education partners, including a visit with the Minnesota private college leaders, and also last week meeting with Minnesota State's Leadership Council to charge next steps on a range of issues, opportunities to work together to serve the state, including our strategic planning process, and the likelihood of convening a leadership summit in the spring around student mental health, which is a challenge that we all share and are committed to helping resolve. To this latter point, I'm pleased to note that we commenced our environmental scan in student mental health for our system and had 100% participation in our system-wide inventory of all activities, resources, and programs related to mental health, and we'll bring you those reports in February. Back to the inauguration, which, by the way, only ended recently, I know, that, uh, which may be a surprise. Uh, in October, I traveled to Rochester, and in November, I traveled to Crookston for my final inauguration visits to our system campuses, and am very grateful to all of our chancellors for hosting me during that process, and to their community, students, faculty, and staff for being so um, open in our conversations while I was there. I went to San Diego, San Francisco, and Palo Alto initially to, initially to attend the APLU conference, where in addition to attending many sessions, I moderated a very well attended panel on student mental health. And then in San Diego, San Francisco, and further up the coast, we met with donors and alums um, with great appreciation to the foundation and the alumni association for um, bringing our communities together in the way that they do so well. We um, launched two searches in the fall, uh, one of which we will talk about later today with our executive vice president and provost, but I have a report on the search for the vice president for human resources. That search has been um, paused until further notice, likely this summer as those searches are on the cycle, but we'll assess the market at that time. Um, I would like to thank our university community and the search committee for their dedicated engagement throughout the search process and thank everyone in advance for when we relaunch the search <laughs> in the coming year for their participation and commitment. But in the interim, Ken Horseman, who currently serves as Senior Director of Total Compensation, Compensation will be the Interim Vice President, effective January 6, 2020. And as we just had the honor of acknowledging, I restate my thanks to Kathy Brown for her many years of service to the university and her commitment to ensuring a smooth transition, which is already underway. I also want to note two additional hires. First, um, we have identified our next university librarian and dean of libraries, Lisa German. She's an accomplished research library leader, and she comes to us from the University of Houston. And second, Rick Hibbish, who's been selected to serve as our new executive director of commercialization. Rick has led TechCom in an interim role and through an incredibly successful period, as you heard during Vice President Chris Kramer's report yesterday, where he helped launch a record 19 new startup companies just last year, five of which are acquired, underscoring the value of University of Minnesota innovations. And as you also heard in Vice President Kramer's presentation, Rick will expand our corporate engagement and corporate partnerships, which we think is a key distinction in this community. Referring to the board charge on institutional history, as part of the administration's work to fulfill the board's charge from April 2019, we have launched several activities, including our ongoing event series, which began in co-sponsorship on November 14th with two events. The first event was primarily in partnership with the provost's office and the FCC and others, where we had an open forum to discuss namings. And then later that evening, <coughs> co-sponsored event with Professor John Wright's Luminary Series, which hosted Professor Christopher Lehman and a panel of other historians and experts, where Dr. Lehman, who is on the faculty of St. Cloud State, talked about his work in his new book, <coughs> Slavery's Reach, Southern Slaveholders in the North Star State. On February 10th, my office will also be co-sponsoring a Twin City screening of a TPT documentary on African American history and the University of Minnesota. And earlier this morning, the Board's Governance and Policy Committee participated in the first of at least a three-step process of presentations related to the development of a renamings framework here. 
The committee provided feedback regarding foreign renamings frameworks, Stanford, Michigan, Yale, and the University of Minnesota's final report of the President and Provost Advisory Committee on University History, also known as the Coleman Committee Report. As next steps, the administration will be providing draft language for the committee to consider at our February meeting. An update on campus dining. In October, the board approved a two-year extension of our campus dining contract with Aramark. Campus dining is an important topic for the entire university community and especially for students. And we've taken steps to advance greater inclusion for them in the decision-making process. Our student advisory committee will now elect one student to serve on the management committee, which is the group that will review and make recommendations to the executive committee that looks at all of our budget decisions and help guide the RFP process. Also, the student advisory committee as a whole will now present their recommendations to both the management committee and the executive committee. And these important steps will ensure better alignment and consultation moving forward. With regard to outreach, um, I mentioned in our, my October report that I charged Matt Kramer, our Vice President of University Relations, to develop a plan to coalesce and quantify the university's existing outreach and engagement efforts, which was a very robust conversation and charge coming from the board after our retreat in July and is now a board goal for this year. Highlighted in front of you is a snapshot, a still, if you will, of an interactive impact web application, which not only highlights these efforts across every county in the state, but literally continues to grow by the hour as our teams work to populate the map with more data. It's a little chaotic right now because we are including everything we do, and we do a lot. But this project is really exciting because it does several things at the same time. It continues in our fulfillment of our uh, membership in the Carnival Carnegie Foundation's Community Engagement Designation, which is the national best practice. And it also gives us a much easier capacity to story tell around what we do and also identify gaps in what we could do better or in better ways to serve our community. As the technology of the map goes from um, where it is now into slightly easier user-friendly use for people like me who find that a little overwhelming, we will do an interactive presentation so that you can see how others can access this information, add to it, how we can use it to understand our fulfillment of our engagement mission and move forward from there. An update on system strategic planning. <coughs> Excuse me. We are consulting widely in our system strategic planning work with faculty, staff, and students, alumni supporters, partners in the legislature, and around the state. This engagement has included town hall meetings during each of my campus visits and at the annual extension conference in Duluth, homecoming on the Twin Cities campus with alumni leaders, the FCC, Twin Cities deans, internal audit, senior leadership team retreats, the Minnesota Water Resources Conference, the UMF board and executive board, the university senate, and across our formal and informal faculty, staff, and student committees, including the Black Faculty and Staff Association, the UM Retirees Association, and among numerous colleges and schools from the CEHD Fall Assembly, the Dean's Advisory Committee at the Humphrey School, the CLA Assembly, and CSC State of the College. I sent out a system-wide message on September 17th and again on October 9th, linking to the initiatives tab on my presidential homepage for input about the commitments. And a similar message was sent to our alumni community and our state's government and elected officials, including our 201 state legislators, the governor and congressional, and lieutenant governor, our congressional delegation, mayors and city council members in Duluth, Crookston, Falcon Heights, Minneapolis, Morris, Rochester, and St. Paul, amongst others. Last week at the State House, I sought deeper input from Senate Higher, Air, Higher Ed Chair Paul Anderson and Ranking Member Greg Clausen, as well as House Higher Ed Chair Connie Bernardi and Ranking Member Bud Nornis. We've also sought feedback amongst the business community from the membership of the Minnesota Business Partnership, Twin Cities Dunkers, and the Capital Club. And we've engaged our tribal partners during the sixth annual Nibi Minowa Manuman Symposium at White Earth Nation and during the Native Nations flag event at the Humphrey School last month. As I mentioned earlier, our important engagement with Minnesota's public and private higher ed institutions also included system strategic planning consultation. And this collective consultation has shaped our university commitments as follows. We are committed to student success, which we are articulating as meeting all students where they are and maximizing their skills, potential, and well-being in a rapidly changing world. 
We are committed to discovery, innovation, and impact, which we articulate as channeling curiosity and investing in discovery to cultivate possibility, innovate solutions, and elevate Minnesota and society as a whole. We are committed to mentor sections, which we articulate as improving the health of people and places at the intersection of our system strengths and opportunities inspired by Minnesota that impact the world. We are committed to community and belonging, fostering a welcoming community that values belonging, equity, diversity, and dignity, and people and ideas. And we are committed to fiscal stewardship, stewarding resources that promote access, efficiency, trust, and collaboration with the state, students, faculty, staff, and partners. These commitments represent the intersection of our values and action as a system, and we intend for them to freely complement and interact with one another. We're now starting to charge senior leaders to consult system-wide in developing goals and action items that align, and we'll start bringing these goals forward probably in phases at our February board meeting with the ultimate intention to present to you a system-wide strategic plan for discussion in May and board action afterwards. Lastly, following this plan, we would initiate a process to review and refresh our maroon and gold measures, likely at the Board of Regents retreat in July. Mm -hmm. A few um, last updates, particularly related to a summary on strategic planning. Members of the board, I would like to take this moment to recognize some of the recent challenges faced within our university system community and with our partners that we are working through and towards, but appreciate the difficulty that they can often present including efforts to incre uh, address increased scrutiny risks in the Twin Cities Health Sciences buildings, the difficult but important budgetary step taken in Crookston in discontinuing their football program, and at UMD to strengthen their financial position, as well as with our M Health Fairview partners, Fairview Health Services. With regard specifically to UMD, and while noting that we do not have all the answers, we have been working very hard at a path forward during this process of eliminating the structural imbalance, the campus placed some of the annual shortfalls into a UMD central account, which is a common practice our finance colleagues would call a sequestered debt. Each year, UMD has worked very hard to reduce the amount of that debt or to mitigate or keep it from growing, but it remains at approximately 6.8 million. To this end, I have asked the system over the next two years to contribute approximately 6.8 million in one-time operational support to eliminate UMD's current sequestered debt that has accumulated. These funds won't offset the structural balance or the changes underway, but it will help to put them on a much firmer financial foundation for the future so that they can begin their strategic planning process or advance strategic goals that they currently have underway with a fresh start. The source of these funds for this decision is part of the state O&M appropriation for fiscal year 20 that was not committed to recurring expenditures in this year's budget as approved by the board. As you will recall, that $8 million was held over for spending needs in the fiscal year 21 budget. Because of that decision, the $8 million was received but remains unspent in fiscal year 20, and enough is available to make these one-time investments as approved. In addition, I would like to recognize that the AFSCME clerical and technical union contract settlements occurred earlier this week with great appreciation to Kathy Brown's team and our negotiators, and especially with great appreciation to AFSCME for the work that they do, that we rely upon every day, and can't function as the excellent institution that we are without. Another nice update, Give to the Max, which is our one-day campaign, was up nearly 50% over last year with 5,300 individual gifts and $7.4 million raised. And we also had a visit, you may have noticed, from ESPN's College Game Day to the Twin Cities campus, and that was the first time, which was a wonderful opportunity for the university to look its finest as a winter wonderland around the country. I um, understand this fact to be true, although someone should verify that that was the most watched game of the year. Lastly, personally, I've been invited to serve as a commissioner for the U.S. Council on Competitiveness and their current iteration, which is work on the U.S. position on innovation and competitiveness. This council and the forum brings together over 200 C-suite leaders from every major sector of the economy, including higher ed, to share their perspectives on how to overcome critical innovation challenges facing the United States. So in closing, um, members of the board and guests, and in this season of service and hope, I want to express my sincere gratitude for the opportunity to serve our incredible university community and our state. 
I thank you all for your support and for all the work you do on behalf of the University of Minnesota. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, President Gable. You've ended with gratitude, and I'll begin my report uh, with thanks and gratitude to all of you uh, on the board and across the university for your well wishes uh, following the accident that caused me to miss the October meeting, uh, and an extra nod to Vice Chair Swigum for stepping into the chair so very, very late. Thank you, sir. I'm glad to report that I'm back to 100%, and just one word of advice, always wear your three-point belt. Second, a big thanks to the undergraduate students who took time away from studying for finals to join us yesterday for lunch and share a bit of their research. It's pretty impressive how programs like the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program work to connect our education and our research missions. That union is one of the things that really differentiates the University of Minnesota from other higher education institutions. Third, I think we all want to thank Coach Fleck and the student athletes on the Gopher football team on a 10 and two season, closing out 2019 ranked number 18 in the nation, headed to the Outback Bowl uh, in a few weeks against Auburn. It's been a wonderful season and we are all very much looking forward to going one and oh in the Auburn season. <laughs> Turning to uh, our work in committees, it was great to hear yesterday's truly stellar annual report in the Mission Fulfillment Committee on our research productivity, scholarship, and commercialization of intellectual product. Just a couple of statistics to remind you. Last year, our research awards rose nearly 9%. We launched 19 startups, over half of them in Minnesota, and we just continue to play a huge role as an economic driver in the state of Minnesota. So that was a wonderful report. Earlier this morning at the Governance and Policy Committee, we grappled with new policy language to govern our work as a board, as well as policy approaches to govern uh, the thorny issues that arise when renaming a building. And I just want to compliment the board for the very respectful and thoughtful conversations on both fronts. And then finally, I want to thank all of my region colleagues for your engagement uh, so far on the East Gateway Development Project. Uh, and for what I know will be your good questions and comments during our discussion later. This project is exciting, uh, but it's also uh, tremendously complex. And we'll hear later in the meeting from the University of Minnesota Foundation uh, as they unveil details uh, about the scope and the vision for East Gateway. So that concludes uh, my report. Moving on to our next item, please note the receive and file items in the docket this month. And those are a quarterly report of grant and contract activity uh, and the East Cliff annual report. Next, we'll consider our consent report. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent report? Move to approve. A second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent report. Is there any discussion? Okay, there being no discussion, all those in favor of approving the report, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion is approved. All right, now we'll move on to the report of the Faculty Consultative Committee. Professor Pittenger, it is always a great pleasure to welcome you and the outstanding faculty that you represent. Thank you for being here. We'll turn the discussion uh, after your presentation. We'll turn, uh, turn it over to the board for uh, questions and comments. So, Professor Pitt Pittenger, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Sigum, members of the board, and President Gable. On behalf of Vice Chair Phil Bullman and my colleagues on the Faculty Consultative Committee and the Senate Consultative Committee, I'm pleased to present to the Board of Regents our, the, our committee's fall semester report. My objective is to provide in updates on selected ongoing efforts of the FCC and SEC, but this report does not describe all of our efforts uh, to date. I just want to begin by thanking you all and acknowledging um, on behalf of the FCC leadership our appreciation for the board's availability and openness for discussion. This semester, Professor Bullman and I uh, met with Regents Davenport, Her, Kenyana, and Mayoron, and it's been great to start our partnership uh, with you all. We've also, as be, has been our regular practice, we met with all of you at the Board of Regents and FCC uh, annual evening event in the fall um, at East Cliff to discuss university issues and to further develop our partnership. Professor Bullman and I look, also look forward to the fall leadership meeting with Chair Powell and Vice Chair Sigum just next week. Um, I also want to uh, mention 
that in November, Regent Tom Anderson attended the uh, Professional Administrative Consultative Committee meeting, uh, which I just want to point that out. His participation is appreciated and just another example of all the many positive ways that you all engage in university governance and why our shared governance model is so strong. The FCC every year uh, in August has a retreat and we set priorities for, the next, for this upcoming year. And then this year we set three priorities. Um, the first being uh, a contract term faculty teaching specialist governance representation and academic freedom task force um, component uh, to explore some of the protections, exploration of system-wide sanction guidelines uh, for faculty misconduct and a conceptualization of a combined mental health Health Advocacy Disability Services uh, Training Program. So we have formed a task force, uh, bless you, on the end of, at the end of October to explore the conditions of term contract faculty and staff with faculty-like roles, specifically in whether um, how to provide representation, academic freedom for this particular component of our university community that does play an important role for our mission, our education mission. The FCC is also in the very early stages of examining approaches for disciplining faculty misconduct. We're consulting with EOAA and the Provost's Office and collecting examples of existing University of Minnesota colleges and programs code of conduct and sanctioning guidelines and learning from our Big Ten colleagues as we consider system-wide approaches. And our last priority um, that we focused a whole third of our retreat in August on was on the resolution on education around best practices for disability <coughs> accommodations and supporting students with disabilities that was passed in the final Senate meeting this past spring. This resolution recommended that the university implement required education on accommodated instruction, testing, and best practices for supporting students with disabilities <coughs> for university faculty, instructors, and student services staff system-wide. During the retreat, we were able to consult with a, a lot of people, and I just want to appreciate that all of the people I'm about to name spent half of their day uh, during a very busy time of the semester with us. So Disabilities Resource Center, the Boynton, Boynton Health, the Aurora Center for Advocacy, and the Organization for Graduate and Professional Students with Disabilities, as well as the Provost's Office. So we are all together, and we were able to provide some input to better understand the processes involved. Uh, with student accommodation and to inform the, the development of future training materials so that we can be as effective as possible in helping our students succeed. As was, has already been mentioned, the FCC and the Provost's Office, as well as many other university groups, co-sponsored uh, a community-wide discussion November 14th on our university history, understand, acknowledge, and engage. The event was really well attended. In fact, we exceeded our capacity and had to move in, and use uh, additional breakout rooms, so that was really wonderful. Undergraduate, graduate, professional students, along with faculty, staff, community members, and members of the board and administration uh, from across the Twin Cities intended. I want to thank uh, Regent Shu, Kenyana, and Rosha for being there. It was really great to have your participation. And I know that many of you would have liked to have attended, uh, but schedule uh, interfered with that, but we hope that you're able to participate in what I'm sure will be additional events. We're really looking forward to seeing the report generated from the, the small group discussions and contributing to the construction of strategies to make our university an inclusive and welcoming community. When I submitted my, this report to you all, we hadn't had our final Senate meeting uh, in December. So, and I know that you've already had your Liberal Education Redesign Committee report yesterday. So you already know that the plans put forward were not adopted. So uh, we're really at the point right now where uh, it's coming back to the faculty. And I anticipate the next step is for the FCC to work very closely with the new provost uh, coming in to build from the good work of the Liberal Education Redesign Committee. I know that the FCC is committed uh, to ensuring that that good work is not lost and becomes the foundation for any next iteration that comes forward. At the December meeting, even though no plans were adopted, the, there were several features of the plans that were praised during the open discussion. And so we just want to make sure that, that good work is continued. And then lastly, I just want to mention that, as you already know, because a lot of this has been discussed, that the FC was very involved in the search for the next provost. 
and we uh, spent a lot of time with all four of the finalists and provided a lot of input to President Giebel. We are truly excited to welcome Dr. Rachel Croson to our campus, and we look forward to beginning our partnership with her this spring. So as I close this report, I want to acknowledge all the excellent support of the University Senate staff, but especially Deputy Director Renee Dempsey. I also want to recognize all the students, staff, and faculty involved in governance who volunteer their time and efforts to make the University of Minnesota shared governance the robust model that it is. I also want to thank you, the members of the board, the president, provost, and administration for your open, engaged consultation and commitment to shared governance as a value and a process. With that, I conclude my report. Okay, well, thank you, Professor Pinger, for that very good report. Uh, colleagues, uh, questions or comments? Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Powell. Um, you complimented us, Professor, let's see, we could use Professor, Chair, Doctor, I don't know what you prefer, but uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll try Chair Pittenger here as Chair of the FCC. You complimented us for engaging, and uh, as I now look back on my time in leadership and continuing on, you are one of the most open and engaging and transparent leaders we've had, and uh, you make it a joy to interact and to engage, so thank you. <clears throat> Other questions or comments for uh, for Chair Pittenger? All right, seeing none, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your report. Our next agenda item is a review of the draft 2018 accountability report. This report is established in board policy as one of the fundamental planning documents of the university. It also fulfills the university's charter responsibility to report annually to the legislature on the state and the progress of the university. The report will return in February for action. So Provost Hansen, thank you for joining us. President Gable, would you like to start uh, the presentation? Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Vice Chair, and members of the board. I'm pleased to uh, present to you the 2019 University Performance and Accountability Report. It looks a little different this year. Um, at the request of a few members of the board and other input that we received, we have reframed the content of the report. First, the report itself has been condensed down to just over 30 pages. The goal in that was to improve readability while retaining transparency and disclosure key information and data that have been included in past editions. But we've also produced an additional highlights overlay, which selects key points from the report in a more digestible form for those who are inclined to receive their information in that way. After the review and discussion today, we'll bring these documents to you for formal approval. But I'd like to turn it over to Provost Hansen to briefly highlight significant points from this report. Thank you. Provost Hansen. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan, <laughs> Chair McMillan, <laughs> Chair Powell, <laughs> and uh, President Gable and members of the board. Um, the accountability report, of course, addresses all areas of our tripartite mission, teaching, research, and outreach engagement. In addition, the material basis for our work, that is uh, finance and operations. But because you just received the annual report on research yesterday, and because the Finance and Operations Committee discusses those topics throughout the year, I'll today just focus on highlights from the student success and the outreach, service, and engagement sections. I'll start with undergraduate education uh, and our Crookston campus, which is a system leader in the online space. Nearly 70% of Crookston online students are Minnesota residents, and many of whom are adult learners returning to college to complete degrees. The degrees these folks are thus able to obtain online are exceptionally valuable. For example, the Crookston Healthcare Management Program is one of just two such online programs that's nationally accredited. In addition to this strength in online delivery, Crookston has a strong pre-vet program, which places students into veterinarian programs at a rate four times greater than the national average. Additionally, their equine science program has seen significant growth over the last two years, thanks in part to more students being attracted to the hands-on, learning-by-doing style that's characteristic of that program. The program enrolled 76 students this fall compared to 43 students two years ago. Finally, the Crookston campus is also one of only 40 institutions in the country 
that have been recognized as a first forward institution for its work with first generation college students. If we turn to the Duluth campus, we note that it serves the state and the nation as a leader in freshwater research, a research focus that's especially appropriate given the campus's location at the headwaters of one vast freshwater system, the Laurentian Great Lakes, and near the headwaters of a major part of another, the Mississippi River. The campus serves a high percentage of students from Minnesota. Over 85% of the student body are Minnesotans, with 60% of those students from the Twin Cities metro area, and the other 40% from greater Minnesota. Duluth's incoming class is also about one-third first-generation students, and more than half of all Duluth undergraduates are university scholarship recipients. I'd also like to note that this past year, the campus crafted a land acknowledgement that was endorsed by the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council on June 4th, 2019. The acknowledgement was the result of a collaborative process involving the Department of American Indian Studies, the campus climate leadership team, the campus climate change team, and participants in the 2019 Summit on Equity, Race, and Ethnicity. Turning now to Morris, a campus that also serves a high percentage of students from Minnesota, nearly 75 percent, uh, and particularly noteworthy is the fact that American Indian students comprise 24 percent of the campus's degree-seeking student population. That's the highest percentage at a four-year non-tribal institution in the upper Midwest. The campus offers a rigorous and engaging academic experience to its students, and one bit of evidence for that is the fact that the Morris faculty are consistent winners of teaching awards. Indeed, Morris has the university's highest percentage of Horace T. Morris Award winners for excellence in undergraduate education. The close-knit Morris community and the campus's small class sizes are often cited by students as keys to Morris students' success in competing for prestigious awards. This past year, two more students were named Fulbright Scholars and one received a Boren Award. Both of those will involve study abroad and um, international education. The Rochester campus also has a highly diverse student body and its graduates go on to help to diversify the healthcare fields, a signally important contribution to the public good. One institutional point that's particularly notable is that the campus has achieved complete success in closing the achievement gap. Students of color on the Rochester campus succeed at rates the same as or greater than their peers. Rochester faculty are researching what's driving this success so that the practices that have been so successful in Rochester can be maintained and perhaps better informed teaching and advising practices across the system. One of the high impact practices the Rochester campus employs is that all students engage in community based learning, after which they propose and pursue a self directed capstone uh, that's tailored to their emerging interests and high aligned with a specific health career pathway. This individualized capstone approach allows for ongoing adaptation as workforce demand in the health industry changes rapidly. Turning to the Twin Cities campus, it's also had success in reducing the achievement gap. Over the last 10 years, the first, generation, first year retention gap between students of color and white students has been reduced from 6% to less than 1%. The four year graduation gap has been reduced from 21% to 12%. And the six year graduation gap has been reduced from 14% to 5%. Overall, Twin Cities graduation rates continue to improve. In fact, the campus has achieved the largest increase in four-year graduation rates over the past 20 years of any doctoral granting institution in the country, public, private, or for-profit, up 47.5 percentage points, over 8 percentage points ahead of the second largest gain, which was at Ohio State University. Additionally, the Twin Cities campus enrolled more Minnesota freshmen in 2019, fall 2019, than at any time in the last 29 years. That were 4,130 students, up 71% since 1991. These are just a few of the highlights of student success in the undergraduate realm. 
Turning to graduate and professional education, I'd like to note a couple of um, items which are, again, in your docket. And we're not representing the docket to you here, but you can find all these materials in those pages, uh, docket pages 92, 94 for this. You, you've heard Vice Provost for Graduate Education, Scott Lanyon, report to you several times that diversity has been among the top priorities for him in his stewardship of graduate education. The report highlights a few of those efforts. The Creative Inclusive Cohorts Training Grant Program, which provides selected graduate programs with multiple recruiting fellowships for students from underrepresented communities is one such effort. And during 2018-19, seven programs were awarded a total of 25 fellowships. And in 2019, 25 graduate students of color and students from underrepresented <coughs> backgrounds took part in a seven-week summer institute designed to help create a welcoming and inclusive climate on campus before classes even begin. Past participants of the institute now serve as peer mentors for current participants. The second and um, third tables that are on page 93 of your docket show the progress we're making in, the er in this area in both graduate and professional programs in terms of uh, diversifying. Finally, I'd call your attention to the, the table, which is on page 94 of your docket, which shows selected professional programs. These and, and primarily just look down at that list. It's a very long list. These programs develop human capital in the areas most needed by the state. And you'll recognize in the listing here the connection, in fact, between these programs and a thriving Minnesota. To conclude, I'll highlight the Outreach, Service, and Engagement section, uh, which is on your docket in page 97-98, uh, which President Gable touched on earlier with the measles map that you had on the uh, board showing our reach across the state. The whole state is covered with spots. Uh, this report provides selected examples of that outreach and public service component of the three-part mission, which is also a key component of our role as a land-grant university. These include, for example, the work of extension, which you heard about yesterday in the Mission Fulfillment Committee, and, and the Robert J. Jones Urban uh, Research and Outreach Engagement Center in North Minneapolis, among many other uh, such examples. These examples um, uh, listed in the report are also address the public engagement strategy that the university has to integrate community partnerships into the university's academic <clears throat> priorities. Again, we list only a few of these examples in the report, but, um, but it, it, it is robust activity. And finally, in this last section, uh, we also note the external and university relations efforts, including our new Youth Central website, very important, which highlights hundreds of university-based activities for youth throughout the state. So the report has been trimmed down. We hope it still includes the information you want. There's a summary for each campus and then some uh, discourse about the other areas. But it is a draft right now, and uh, we will take your comments and try to give you a final version at the next meeting. All right, well, thank you, Provost Hansen, for reviewing the accountability report, which is a, a, a really good report, and we always look forward to, to seeing the latest, uh, latest version. So I think with that, Turn it over to uh, colleagues uh, on the board for any questions or, or comments or, or feedback for the provost on the accountability report. <clears throat> it looks like you've passed with flying colors. <laughs> I would like I would like to make a comment. I do I do appreciate that the report um, continues to be very data rich. Um, but it, it, it does have increased focus. Mm -hmm. and, and my view in, in looking over it was that that, in, in a way, increases the accessibility of the report and the information. And so I, I appreciate that. And I also think that the way that the, um, the, the summary has been organized along the line of, of um, strategic priorities is also, I think, just as a communication tool, I, you know, also is, is, is positive. So um, uh, I, I thought it was, um, you know, as, as useful and as comprehensive as ever, but in, in a way, you know, easier to, easier to access. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chair Powell. And uh, I want to say that that was a, a, a joint effort with the President's Office, but particularly with Marlo Relshin, who really works, has had this baby in her hands for, for quite a long time, and she did a, quite a lot of work in redesigning this. So we well, are. thank you. 
Thank you. We appreciate it. All right. Okay. Um, before we um, before we turn it over to uh, our, the East Gateway team, let me just acknowledge uh, our, to the, our, my fellow board members that Regent Emeritus Peggy Lucas uh, has just joined us. And uh, Peggy, it's very good to see you. So the next item is the review of the East Gateway project. And I'd like to welcome uh, uh, to the table uh, University of Minnesota Foundation President Kathy Schmittelkoffer, uh, UMF Council, uh, Jennifer Bishop, and past UMF Chair Ross Levin uh, to the presenter's table. A uh, current chair, uh, Lynn Casey, was unable to be here with us today. I want you to know she sends her regrets. Uh, and I can attest uh, and ensure you that she's been deeply engaged uh, in the process of uh, bringing this uh, information to us today. So um, before turning the meeting over to uh, our presenters, I'd like to propose uh, the following. Let's let them present the project uh, in its totality. And then we'll open it to all of you for questions and comments. I know there's a lot of interest uh, on the board in this project and its details. We look forward to hearing uh, from each of you during the discussion. Uh, let me also say that after the presentation and before uh, we move on to, uh, to your questions, uh, President Gable uh, will uh, we'll have a few co uh, comments to make uh, on this project. So with that, uh, President Schmilkoffer, over to you and your team. Well, good morning, Chair Powell, President Gable, members of the Board of Regents. I'm actually going to turn this over to our past chair, Ross Levin, to provide some opening comments on behalf of the Board of Trustees. And I'm going to follow protocol. Good morning, Chair Powell, President Gable, <laughs> and members of the Board of Regents. How'd I do? Uh, my name is Ross Levin. I'm the immediate past chair of the University of Minnesota Foundation Board of Trustees, and I have had a 40-year love affair with the university. Uh, I'm here today representing our 45 trustees, many of whom are sitting back there. And uh, one fourth of these trustees are appointed by the regents yourselves, and we appreciate that. Thank you, Regents Anderson and Beeson and McMillan for your current service. And thank you, Regent Rocha, for your service on our audit committee, which unfortunately even you cannot make interesting. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm joined. <laughs> No matter how hard you try, I, I'm, uh, I'm joined by uh, Kathy Schmittelkoffer, President and CEO of the University of Minnesota Foundation, and uh, UMF's counsel, Jennifer Reedstrom Bishop from Great Plant Moody. Thank you for your time today to review the current status of our collaborative efforts in the East Gateway District, uh, specifically the project led by the foundation, the East Gateway Project, which Chair Powell, I think, earlier and accurately described as both exciting and complex. Uh, and in fact, the complexity is also partly why it's exciting. For over 50 years, the Foundation and its trustees have been proud to celebrate and support the U's academic research and outreach mission. Outreach mission. Uh, as you know, a generous gift from James Cargill to the Foundation in 2007 and the completion of the gift in 2012 resulted in the creation of the Foundation subsidiary University of Minnesota Real Estate uh, Advisors. And UMFRIA has been an important part uh, of the Foundation and it's been an important source of expertise for the Foundation and a valuable partner to the University. Over the last decade, the university has crafted its vision for our eastern edge, and it began with the Twin Cities Campus Master Plan back in 2009, and then further refined with its Neighborhood Connection Plan in 2014, and specific development goals for the eastern edge of the Twin Cities Minneapolis campus in 2016. Throughout this, the foundation has listened and partnered with the U to support the university's vision. And as a result, with the support of university leaders and trustees, UMFRIA was well positioned to quickly and nimbly acquire and safeguard property on the eastern edge of campus for the right time to advance the U's larger aspirations. So in addition to this project, the foundation and university have partnered on critical programs such as the Greek safe housing loan effort, Glen Sheen economic impact strategy, real estate development at the U of M Rochester, 
the Tower Side Innovation District, and more. Our partnership with you has never been stronger. Foundations, trustees, and leaders have for the last decade had the pleasure of working with three presidents, regents, past and present, and university senior leaders in finance, real estate, and legal to get to today's discussion of the East Gateway Project. This is a critical and exciting time, bringing much of your work to reality, and we look forward to doing this together. So what I'd like to do is briefly lay out what we expect in the next few months to realize progress on this vision. Thank you. Today we are here to review where the project is at and to ensure we're all informed and have the opportunity to ask and answer questions about the key principles and terms. And over the next two months, we'll take time to respond to any individual questions, refine our thinking, and begin circulation of draft terms with key constituents. In February, we'll return to this body and seek your approval of a few deliverables. And of course, we will continue to work together over the coming months and years as this comes to life. We keep, look forward to keeping you connected as we work together to realize a district-wide vision. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kathy. Thank you, Ross. Well, Chair Powell, President Gable, members of the Board of Region, again, on behalf of the Foundation and the trustees, thank you for your time today to talk about the East Gateway Project. You know, since I arrived in early 2014, I have to say the vision of what's possible just outside this bu building has been a topic of much conversation and interest for the university and our community and our broader city as well. And today we are ready to get started on a significant component of that larger district vision. This project will begin our pathway toward intentionally unlocking an important gateway to campus, one fitting of this university's world-class status. The East Gateway Project, represented here in gold, is ready for the private sector partnerships to invest in this future innovation district. By bridging the Biomedical Discovery District and the Athletics Complex to the clinical campus and the river, together we can realize a once in a generation opportunity to positively impact our community of stakeholders. And as Russ just described, not only is this vision aligned with the university's long range plans, but also equally important, extensive due diligence has been performed to get us to this point. Collaborative and experienced partners, both inside and outside the university, have come together to share in this vision and mission-focused work. And of course, this vision for the east end of campus isn't new. It started with the construction of this very building over 20 years ago, the McNamara Alumni Center. It was funded, designed, and built by the University Gateway Corporation, a collaboration between the foundation and the Alumni Association that sits on land owned by the university. It has become an iconic structure on campus, and it is the proud home to the foundation, to the Alumni Association, as well as to all of you, the Board of Regents. And the Eastern Edge continued to grow. What started as a lone structure northeast of campus with the Lions Research Building has grown to what we now celebrate as the Biomedical Discovery District. Funded with state and private support, it represents a powerful constellation of our best basic and translational science in medical research. And of course, who can deny the new vitality that returned to campus when the TCF Bank Stadium opened in 2009, again funded with private and public support. And in early 2016, our health system partners, the University of Minnesota Physicians and Fairview Health Services, opened the clinics and surgery center on university-owned land, further anchoring a vision to align breakthrough research to the care delivery commitment that we make to our patients. An investment in place is happening all over the country. There are several reasons universities start thinking about placemaking, and often it's for those intangible benefits that are so important to creating a vibrant and welcoming community. Safety, innovation, game day experience, a welcoming place for our patients and their families, all reasons to consider investing in place. Together with our partners in the university, we believe all these drivers have a place in this vision of this project, the East Gateway Project. And while being both vibrant and welcoming are important qualitative outcomes, we know in fact that this kind of district-wide vision and planning 
has real quantitative returns and can be a true competitive advantage. We commissioned HRNA, an economic consulting firm out of New York City, and they have provided an economic impact analysis comparing ourselves to a handful of innovation districts and other peer institutions. They specifically evaluated the quantitative impacts of the universities in St. Louis, Atlanta, Boston, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. They looked at specific metrics tied to growing their research portfolio and increased revenue. Each of these peer institutions saw significant growth in research expenditures, income from licenses, innovation disclosures, and new patent applications. And as we translate just the median value of growth that those institutions realized against our University of Minnesota's 2018 reported performance in those areas, we can suggest similar kind of potential for growth. The result is significant impact, not only for revenues to this university, but really the economic vitality of the region and the state as well. And we are ready to do this together. Together we can support a district-wide plan by driving connections between each of these projects. And in doing so, we need to ensure that land ownership is aligned with the driver of each product in order to create those predictable uh, processes for success. And also timing is important if we wanna be at the table for some important state, county, and local infrastructure, dis infrastructure decisions that are me being made today. And we do this work with the university and appreciate their de determination to pre preserve the use human and financial resources for its highest purposes, <coughs> its core academic and research missions. And you might ask whether you see foundations working to advance their universities through these kind of real estate endeavors. And while every project and every financial man model, like every university, is unique, when you've seen one, you've seen one, what is clear is that foundation leadership around real estate development is not unique. From smaller universities across the river to peer institutions and a diverse set of institutions in between, we can see that we are in good company as we think about real estate in the foundation. And what made this great opportunity for the University of Minnesota Foundation? Well, as Ross mentioned, it began with a gift. In 2007, James Cargo gifted $38 million in real estate in the Stadium Village area on campus to the foundation. The Dinikin properties became known as Umphrea, the University of Minnesota Real Estate Advisors. This gift, along with the university investments in the east side of campus, prompted aspirational, visional thinking around this area and how it could be better and serve as a new intentional gateway to the university community. This led to the university and the foundation discussing how real estate gifts and investments could be best used to advance the university's mission. In 2013, the foundation's trustees, in line with our charitable obligation, defined the Umphrea business plan to act on behalf of the mission of the foundation and the university it serves. Since that time, the foundation and the U have strategically and nimbly moved to secure properties in the district for the realization of a larger, not parcel by parcel, district vision for this campus and its surrounding community. And we're ready to move from acquiring and administrating the land in this project area to advance the development vision for this district. Together with the U, we have amassed enough land in the project area to make a district plan possible. We have a partner in the private sector, UMark Properties, owned by the Polad family, who brings resources, expertise, and experience, and importantly, a commitment to the larger missional vision. The, foundations and the, po the foundation and the Polads have created a partnership called VSIS to set ourselves to the best standards of our aspirations. And we sit at the doorstep of some of those important city and county and private sector decisions that will impact our campus for generations to come. So really the time is now to start thinking about this first project, the East Gateway project. And like every project in the foundation, we start with the principles grounded in our commitment to serving the university. We recognize that in this district and importantly in this project, we need to seamlessly connect to the larger vision. We aspire to have a healthy mix of land purposes, not just the parcel by parcel micro student housing that we've been seeing on campus lately, but really innovation in office space residential, hospitality, retail, restaurants, and those startup spaces all designed to be flexible 
with the times and the opportunity as it presents itself. We imagine a first floor in public realm space with energy, with engaging experiences that bring energy and excitement, as well as safety and sustainability. And we aspire to raise the bar on design, density, and architectural standards that aspire to be models for the region and possibly even nationwide. And at this very early stage, that concept might come alive, somewhat similar to the kind of concept model you see on the screen today. Again, office, residential, innovation, public realm, all connected intentionally and strategically. Let me illustrate some of the massing and some of the uses. With one million of square feet dedicated to office and innovation spaces, outlined here in blue, about 860 residential units in yellow, about 220 hotel rooms, and certainly hospitality space shown in orange. <coughs> and then about 195,000 square feet of vibrant first floor and acres of public realm connecting the community to the ground level as well. All in all, we think the project area will represent approximately about 3 million square feet of space. In moving forward, we have an opportunity to align land ownership with a larger district in mind. The university and the foundation each own land in the respective project areas shown here. But aligning is not, but it is not aligned with the organization in the best position to develop that land. By aligning the land ownership, each of us can fully plan and control the envisioned development, whether in the center of the East Gateway project or the future clinical campus project area. For the foundation, the land alignment allows us to start working with developers, potential anchor tenants, and the city with the full confidence that we will have what is necessary for the regulatory process and structures. Because this land transaction principles and transactions are important, as well as a new MOA, as well as um, infrastructure that will impact this district, I'm now going to turn this presentation over to Jennifer to take us through some of the details. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so turning to some of the details around um, the relationship between the foundation and the, and the university as we move forward with the projects, you will see less exciting um, picture slides and more words as the lawyer starts to talk, so I apologize for that. Um, so before we get into walking through the land transaction principles, um, wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that we've worked with university administration um, and did an appraisal of the properties that are the subject of um, our discussion discussion this morning, and those, um, those are of approximately the same size and um, square footage, and also the value of those properties are approximately the same. So as we, even though even trade does not necessarily, um, uh, is determinative of the transaction swap, we thought it was important to start with that concept as well. So as we've been working with uh, real, University Real Estate Administration and also the General Counsel's Office, really developed a few key land transaction principles to support the project. So there would be perpetual ownership by the university or the foundation following conveyance of the title to the land that we're proposing be transferred. That the land parcels owned by the respective entity that would be control of the development of that land. So the university would be receiving land needed for the clinical campus. The foundation would be receiving land needed for the East Gateway Development Project. Third, we would not do uh, the actual land title transfer until certain contingencies are satisfied, primarily on the foundation land, that would be donor restrictions, and on the university land, significant infrastructure contingencies that we'll talk about further. In addition, we know that we have an existing MOU between the university and the foundation. We also know that existing MOU does not speak to the relationship between the foundation and the university as we move forward in a development aspect of this land project. And so we've been working with, um, again, real estate administration as well as a general counsel's office to develop proposed memorandum of agreement terms with specifically with regard to the East Gateway project. Um, and to date, as we know, as Kathy mentioned, the foundation has been in the process of acquiring and administering real estate for the purpose of serving the university. And so now, as we move into this new phase of development, we look to working with the university to develop what those terms would be. 
So clearly the foundation, as we look at this project, um, would be designing and execution of the project because it would be framed as a private development project. But critically, we are creating a special committee of the foundation that would be comprised of regent appointees that are subject matter experts. That would be the linkage between the regents and the University of Minnesota Foundation as it considers uh, important decision-making points with regard to de the development. Those would include the uh, initial concept plan, the selection of developers, the determination of the ground lease terms, and if there's conflict of interest situations, those would also go through the special committee and require region to appointee approval. Uh, we'll of course, regular reporting back to the Board of Regents, and Kathy has just outlined prior the initial concept plan and the development principles that are under consideration. I mentioned earlier, and Ross did as well, um, that we'll be returning to this board with some frequency in the coming years. The primary area for that will be around the infrastructure, which are so important to the development of the East Gateway project. We know we'll work collaboratively um, with the university to find solutions to extend the Delaware Street Southeast to alle alleviate the clinical traffic congestions that we all experience as we're trying to get off of Huron Avenue. A shared approach to the very important infrastructure of IT, stormwater, and steam tunnel um, that would be disrupted as we move uh, the title to those properties to the foundation. Know that the expense of that replacement infrastructure will be borne by the East Gateway Project, not borne by the university. Of course, the university in those conversations and discussions can decide that it wants upgrades to those facilities, and that would be under uh, agreement and consideration by the parties as well. Finally, maybe most importantly, when we're talking about the university, parking will be an important component of the project and really we believe and we have worked with the university administration knowing that we need a district-wide solution to those parking challenges that will be presented. So thank you, Jennifer. As we wrap up, I would like to share with you kind of our near-term steps. We've categorized them in two key areas that we would like to actually parallel path these next steps. First of all, the first category is what is the foundation and the university going to be working on together in January and coming back with February approvals on? And then the second area is where the foundation through VSIS will be starting to work um, with the city um, on this project. Uh, with regard to the university and the Board of Regents, um, we would like to get started on establishing that special committee, talking about the region of Porty, as well as the trustees who will be members of that committee. Certainly like to get us ready uh, to have approval on the necessary land transactions, the concept plan, and the memorandum of agreement that Jennifer just outlined in terms of ter terms. And then certainly make sure that we establish those right touch points as we continue to come back and work together as we bring forth the East Gateway project vision. With the city, uh, we will be developing, uh, starting the city entitlement process, which includes developing uh, the AUAR scenarios. If you're not familiar with what an AUAR is, it's an alternative urban area review. Um, it's also uh, another way of looking at an environmental impact study. An AUAR is usually used for district planning um, as an environmental impact study is usually used for individual parcels. Um, we are excited to start the AUAR process with the city. It's not a common process uh, that the city goes through. In fact, there's only been two in recent history uh, with the city of Minneapolis, one for the U.S. Bank Stadium neighborhood and plan, and another uh, uh, just north of downtown on uh, the Mississippi River called the Upper Harbor Terminal. And you may have been watching the papers. The uh, Fort site is going through an AUAR with the city of St. Paul right now. Uh, certainly, as we work through the city, we have lots of refinement to do on financial models. We'll continue to do that work as things become more um, solidified and then continue to work with the city, obviously, on the concept plan and the development principles as well. So there is much excitement and obviously eagerness on our part to getting this vision advance um, to the next phase. And we are really looking forward to looking with, working with all of you, uh, especially in the month of January and February as we move to approvals. So as, uh, as Kathy have said, has said, we're honored for the opportunity <coughs> and we're very excited to get this project launched uh, into its public phase. The East Gateway District sits at the epicenter of this region 
central to both downtowns and the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. It's a much coveted location for those who want to be close to the U and its world-changing work. The energy and readiness is here, and we believe we have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to finally transform with a district-wide vision this eastern edge of our East Bank campus, campus. And we think time is now. We need to unlock this campus and inspire future connections that create a competitive advantage not only for our university but for our region and our state. Investments have been made. Partners are inspired by the U's vision and opportunity. And remember, for over 50 years, the foundation has served its university by connecting the private sector to the academic research and outreach mission of this great institution. As we enter this new partnership, we look forward to honoring with good governance and management the trust and confidence that you have given this foundation and its trustees as we work toward achieving a vision that we know will elevate the University of Minnesota's world-class status. Seeing no further questions. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> Thank you, Chair Powell, President Gable, and the Regents. We look forward now to um, your comments and your input in reviewing uh, the work to date and things we should consider as we move forward with this project. All right, well, thank you for that um, presentation. And I think now would be a good time before we turn it over for questions and, and, and some framing remarks that I have. I'd like to hear uh, from President Gable and, and her thoughts and comments on the project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the foundation, uh, its staff, its volunteer board members for bringing forward this innovative East Gateway project. I think it's a great idea. I've seen this type of project work in other areas across the nation, from Georgia Tech having grown up in Atlanta and watched that entire campus change as the result of a project like this, to the University of Pennsylvania down the road from where I did my undergraduate work, to Wash U in St. Louis, which was a competitor of the institution where I served as a business school dean, to Pittsburgh, where there is now a corridor between Carnegie Mellon University and Pitt that is inspiring a lot of student interest and corporate partnership. An innovation hub here in the Twin Cities would be transformational. It would catalyze our commitment to cultivate possibility, innovate solutions, and elevate Minnesota and society as a whole, which is part of our strategic planning commitment rubric. It should result in an increase in research expenditures, leading to new opportunities for innovative patent applications, breakthrough cures, attraction of trailblazing startups. It's a student attraction, and it's a creator of economic impact on our university community and our state. When I look out across the street at East Gateway, or the area we have described as East Gateway, I can see a vibrant landscape possibility where a variety of office space, entertainment, hotel, and commercial enterprises can complement the investment we're making in our medical and academic health enterprise and expertise and in the draw of our competitive athletics facilities. I thank the University Foundation for their hard work and planning on how the East Gateway area can better serve our community. And I'm looking forward to the governance parameters set in place by our Office of the General Counsel. So members of the board, I recommend moving ahead with this project in the way we've described with foundation leadership. And I look forward to the foundation's work in advancing next steps. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities would be pleased to have this area as our new neighbor. Thank you. Oh, thank you, President Gable. So um, what I'd like to do now uh, as we turn it over for questions and comments is to, is to offer uh, to the board um, five framing questions uh, that may be helpful to you uh, as, uh, uh, as we have this discussion. And uh, Becca, I think, is handing this out for you right now, maybe, maybe helpful. Um, so the questions, um, the questions are, are these. Um, the first one is, uh, how do you feel about the vision? Uh, of this of this project, including uh, its advancement by the foundation rather than the university. Second question is has to do with the concept plan, and what is the right degree of board guidance and control over planning, and if so, what parameters are sufficient for our purposes? Uh, the third question is what is the right structure and timing uh, of the land transactions uh, at issue, uh, which uh, were touched on by Jennifer. The fourth question is, are the contemplated guardrails to avoid conflicts of interest appropriate and sufficient? And this question refers to the special committee 
uh, that, uh, that Jennifer uh, uh, described. And then lastly, should there be future controls beyond the concept of <coughs> approval and the land swap commitments and contingencies uh, that UMF processes be approved in January, so we, in, in February. So we want ongoing control. So uh, maybe, hopefully those are maybe a little bit helpful. There is a, there is a lot here. Now I'll, we're we're going to open it up for discussion now. Uh, I, we're, I'm sure I'll hear from everybody, but uh, uh, the, uh, the floor is open. I'll start, it out. I'll start it out. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, presenters. I've had the opportunity to, um, to um, um, engage on this project for now um, uh, a couple of years and work with the staff uh, as part of my service to the foundation. Uh, and certainly, without the help of Sarah Harris, um, uh, the support of Kathy and the board, we wouldn't be where uh, we are today. Um, we, the, the, we have only one chance to do something spectacular in terms of a project. This is the only location on campus where, where it's unbuilt um, that we have the chance to do something very, very different. And I'm glad you, uh, Ms. Schmittelkopf, talked about this building because this is a representation of what that project can be. That was a pro this was a project that was not done by the university itself, but it was done by friends of the university through the Alumni Association, the foundation, and now we have a legacy building. It's a, it's a great building. Everybody agrees on it, but it happened because it, we had the involvement of friends of the university. There was consultation with the university, but it was not a university project. We cannot do this project ourselves. We, there's a lot of reasons why we can't do it. Um, but having it in the hands of friends uh, of ours, along with uh, support from the private sector, is the right combination. And while development, and it's got a lot of risk, we know, but there is no reward. There is no great project. There's no gateway project without, without doing this. So I think we, it is, um, you know, beyond the, the land swap, which is very practical and very critical, this, this, is, this is our one chance to do something really significant here. And I'm glad you framed these questions, uh, Chair Paul, because uh, I think the, 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 uh, it organizes sort of the key issues. Uh, I think we do deserve a concept plan. I think, the, I think the developers, and we've got a wonderful trusted partner with the Polad family, I think we have to build out this concept plan so that we know we have expectations and maybe they're, they're um, in our mind's eye, but we have a vision. Uh, you had some drawings. We need to, we need, need to have something, I think, a concept plan. While, while that will be a living organism, it will be, it's still important for us to have. Uh, I think the, the structure and timing of land transactions you talked about, holding back the sale of some of the land, I believe, until we've got relocation plans, and I, you know, I think that's probably right. Guardrails are in place. Um, the, I think there's going to be a question one of my colleagues is going to ask, and I think it's a good question about whether we're, we're cutting ourselves short in terms of the need for more land for our academic medical campus. And um, we are getting the land that we're, that's contemplated in this agreement, and I think we're, at the end of the day we're going to have, we're going to be using some of the space in this block. I mean, the university has to be in the project. It has to have some, it has to have some visibility in the project. And I think uh, I would, I, I don't know if Mr. Bertelson is here, but I have, I have counseled him that we need to get more aggressive for south of Fulton. If we had been more aggressive north of Fulton, we wouldn't be paying the kind of money that we've had to pay to get the land that we're trying to get now. So we need to be more expansive on our medical campus, but I would say go further south uh, and we can redevelop some buildings. That's a long-winded answer. I know that this issue is going to get raised, but I, I really applaud. I think this project checks all the boxes uh, in, in terms of setting it up for success. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Regent Beeson. Uh, Regent Davenport. Uh Thank you, Chair. I, um, I'm very excited about this project. It's exactly what we should be doing as a university 
not just for the university, but for the state of Minnesota. Um, I don't know much. I'm not an expert in real estate. I'm glad others here are. But I do know about uh, relationships between colleges and universities and their foundations. And I want to express my trust and confidence in the work that I've seen um, within this relationship here and as it, as it moves forward. I'm looking forward to the concept plan and further discussions and looking forward to February. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Regent Danford. Uh, Regent Russia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, you know, kind of getting back to these points um, that you put in front of us, Mr. Chair, and I think they're very, very well uh, stated. Um, I, I don't think anyone has any quarrel with the previous two speakers. I think everybody recognizes that there's tremendous opportunity. We've seen some renderings, but we recognize that they're, you know, fairly fluid at this point yeah. as to what, what things will actually look like. So I don't know that I, I'm not going to address that because I think we're all sort of, I mean, I haven't heard anybody say, absolutely not, we want to keep things static. And, but, but really it's now how do we move forward and mm -hmm. how do we make sure there's this balance between the board's obligations and constitutional charge and, and uh, ensuring that, you know, this is really, as, as you point out, this is our big opportunity. It's also kind of our last frontier, you know, with the way, uh, and on this campus anyway, uh, with the way Dinky Town is developing and so on. This, you know, so we have to be very mindful of this because this is a long, long-term decision. And so I, I'm excited about it. Um, one seems to kind of, the, the, the degree to which specificity in the, in the first question uh, is requ uh, required sort of depends a little bit on what some of the other things um, uh, end up happening, meaning, you know, the more that we give, the more that we're going to sort of pass on our ability to be involved in decision making, you know, the more I would think that we would need some clarity on what we can expect to ensure that we're meeting our fiduciary duty. Um, I recently asked a series of questions about dorms and, and housing, and, and in fact, the answers sort of covered some questions I should have asked, but I hadn't, and I, and I appreciate getting that information. And so I, I have a sense, at least based on, on what I received, that the position is that we are where we need to be. Uh, dormitory wise and and we've got some apartment housing there's some housing that will be developed here although I don't know that it's got you know from a board standpoint you know I think we want to make sure that there's focus on housing that's going to impact our our student community and and others that may want to live in the area so I think I've gotten pretty good information about that and as we synthesize and go forward in these next couple months I may have some more questions on that but one question I'll ask and it, it actually kind of comes up because Tangentially, in a, in a significant conversation yesterday, some people brought up compensation for athletic coaches, and I would note that we have a very large a kind of oval-shaped building right next to it uh, in, in the football stadium. We've made substantial investments, which we expect to pay for themselves over time. Um, in that interest, it, could someone speak just a little bit to your expectations on how that part of what we offer on that end of campus would be impacted by this project? And, you know, to ensure that we're not going to put ourselves where we've made these commitments and we pay these substantial salaries with the expectation that it generates income for itself, but then we do things that may sort of, you know, does it enhance our capacity to maximize or does it, does it create challenges? Could somebody speak to that briefly? Chair Powell, Regent Rosha, it's a great question, and it's a reason to get really excited about this East Gateway project. Uh, one of the things that we talked about and we will further explore in the concept plan is the uh, ground floor, uh, the first floor and the public realm curation. Um, nobody gets more excited about game day experience than I do. And so to be able to have another gathering place uh, for folks both pre and post games, uh, whether it's football, basketball, hockey, um, and so many of the sports complex that are in that area, uh, we think that we're going to be able to offer more and more to the visitors who come to campus, especially for game day. I think for all of us, too, it will help alleviate traffic congestion um, because it will give people places to go and experience and plan more of time on campus and rather just being in and out for the actual game itself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, now, thank you. I, I have a... Uh, an eight-year-old boy who might challenge you for that excitement on game day, but uh, oh. <laughs> you, uh, but no, I, no, I appreciate that. I know that you're mindful of that. It, it, it does change the dynamic a little bit. You know, obviously, there's a lot of people consider a lot of the facilities there as as uh, quaint as they are to be, you know, somewhat historic and part of their experience. And and I'm at least mindful of that. But for me, it, it really does come down in in. in I wish I had a better answer, but it, when I look at some of these things about the right structure and timing. Um, we are partners, obviously. We're tremendously 
inter intertwined and, and uh, your success is our success and, and our success is your mission. So, um, and I use our in a very uh, sort of formal way, being that we're the board. But um, so it really, yeah, that's, that's just been my concern all along is to ensure that the type of data that we have is commensurate with the amount of, of uh, um, oversight that we would would seed and 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 not in a competitive way I, I don't think that I mean that's the danger in this is if I say well we need to exercise our fiduciary uh, oversight you know somebody says well you know you don't trust us that's not the point it's never the point um, and, and any more than when we um, make other determinations of things that come to the board for approval um, I, I, I will just again say that we, we talk so much about these land swaps and and I for one and I don't know if others are, are part of this it, 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 I don't think it's really relevant, uh, the, the second part of it, because if we have a need for Delaware, I would presume that the foundation would be there to support it, even if we weren't even talking about this project, that that's something that would already be occurring, and it wouldn't require the swap for that to happen, nor do I think the swap has to happen at Delaware uh, for us to believe this is a good project and we're going to provide these um, um, properties and, and uh, seed oversight function in, in some way in the future, um, I think that can happen independently. And so I just find myself getting confused by this secondary conversation because those really do stand on their own. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chair, um, again, I don't have a great deal of clarity, but, but I think the point that I would make is simply that as we go forward and as we're asked to turn things over and move into a minority status, even with our appointees, that we've had enough of a, of a concept plan and enough opportunity to, to pass um, uh, our, our judgment on these things um, that, that, you know, we can honestly say that we're, we're doing what we're supposed to as a board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Rocha, for those, for those comments uh, and the question. Um, Regent Anderson. Thank you, Chair Paul. Um, it's an exciting project fr from my point of view. Um, I'll just mention the land swap first. You know, the, the concept of the land swap, if everything else is equal, the uh, values and everything else, I actually like the land swap simply because it defines our medical facility area. We get land in what on this map is our future clinical campus area. So everything else being equal, I, I like doing the land swap. Um, you know, I anticipate this project is having, I, I think we've got a great university. We talked about that yesterday with research. We're ninth in the country. Mm -hmm. This will only do things to enhance that from what, what I've seen. And I also see it as a project that I, I think all of us, we sit in these chairs, but we don't own them. There's somebody that sat in them before us, and there's somebody that's going to sit in it after us. Our job is to be stewards while we're here. And I take a, a great deal of um, responsibility in knowing that we're doing what is right and knowing it has to be done right. And so I, I, do, I, I do rely on legal counsel because, you know, the legal counsel, I can't do that. I can't do the real estate. But I think for a project like this to be done, it takes several things. It takes a vision that this can be done. It takes exploration on what is possible and how is it possible. You guys have went out and done some of that. It takes time planning. You have to figure out where are we, how do we get all the pieces in a row. It takes finances. You've got to figure out how do we pay for what we want to do? Where does it work out? And finally, it takes execution, which will be a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, I think some, at least in my, in my estimation, I've asked some of those questions about housing. I think as the way it sits now, and it's certainly up for discussion, but the university has a first right of refusal or at least thought process on any housing. If we wanted to put a dorm on top mm -hmm. of something, we can do that. So, so we're not giving that away. Um, so without, without taking much more time, I envision this project, you know, you folks are somewhere along that line, vision, exploration, time planning, finances, execution. There's no reason not to continue moving forward in that if it's a great project for this university. 
and I look at it, I started to sit in this chair. That's a smaller concept, but it, it's something like that. The vision, vision and the exploration of Athletes Village was here when I sat here. I wasn't in the vision and the exploration, but I came in on the time planning, the finances, and the execution. And I think moving forward with the right balance between oversight, regulation, what we have between UMF and the university, and we have to define that right balance. I think this is certainly a project that we want to get involved and let the next people that sit in our chairs be able to move and have the ability to move this forward to make our university even better. So thank you. I don't need a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Anderson. Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Powell. Um, this project has been around for a long time, and um, I, I've always been excited by it. I've always thought that uh, these are great things. Uh, I do have concerns about how it's being structured. Um, I have concerns about, well, let me ask a question before um, of the chair. So we were, we were issued a large memorandum uh, by our general counsel. So th that memorandum has a lot of information in it, a lot of points, but it's privilege. So at what point do we, are we able to waive the privilege and talk about the, the issues in, in that report or in that memo? Well, I'm going to defer to the general counsel on that question. Chair Paul, Regent Chu, um, as noted by our UMF friends, this project is complex, involves a lot of um, legal questions and including legal advice. Um, any privilege decision with regard to waiver would need to be a decision by the full board and I would counsel against waiver of the privilege, um, particularly since um, I'm not aware of sort of the scope or reach of of what um, is involved in the in the suggestion. Um, at the same time, um, there are fact questions with regard to this project that um, are commented about um, in this conversation this morning. I think the the dimensions of the projects are laid before you and public fashion in a PowerPoint. And so if that leads um, you, Regent Shu, or any other regent to have sort of questions about its structure, its dynamic, um, and what have you, and those questions can be asked without reference to the privileged advice within the memorandum, which I believe they could be, um, all of that is certainly fair game for public conversation this morning and would be appropriate for public conversation. So I hope that's helpful. Doesn't, it doesn't really help me, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I'll, just, I'll just continue by saying that, uh, some, stating some of my concerns. Um, one is that uh, over 900 uh, student housing beds will be displaced by this project. There's, um, at, at this point, no um, clear indication of where those uh, would be replaced and who would replace them. Um, obviously, there's going to be some high-priced housing, whether it's student housing or not. If the um, Dinican properties to tip of the land swap doesn't make sense in, in this context. Um, you know, whether or not we want to give, uh, provide land for this project is a whole other issue. And if, if there is, uh, a future use uh, for the university, uh, for the future uh, clinical campus, then I would expect that that would be a conversation with the foundation where the foundation would say, here, here's the land. We want to contribute this. We think we agree with you. It's the best um, use of the, the property. Uh, so let's go ahead and do this. So I don't, I don't see that this as a, a trade or a swap. And uh, so that's one, one issue that I have. The other issue is control and approvals going forward. Now, 
So we looked at this project a year ago, and we knew almost nothing about this. We did not receive a general counsel's memo at the time. We didn't know anything. There were a lot of questions at the time, obviously. And uh, the chair, um, McMillan at the time, and Powell, vice chair, I think uh, you did the right thing by putting it on hold for a year. And here we are a year later with more information about the project in this pri privilege memo, which again, as I stated before, raises a lot of concerns about what's going on here. And uh, so I, um, I guess we'll have future conversations about that. But I think the university, and, and to Regent Anderson's point, the university, the, whoever is sitting in these seats 10 years from now, maybe some of us, maybe none of us, uh, there needs to be some control and some approvals uh, going forward for the Board of Regents. And I think more than what's been suggested to us, which is this committee. And, you know, the, the presentation was great, it, but it glossed over a lot of things that need to be addressed in this thing. And um, I just hope that we have more time to discuss this because now we're just, we're talking about approving this in February, which is our next meeting. And I don't think a lot of the issues have been addressed since we've been provided the memorandum and had some small briefing uh, meetings on, on this project. Um, I guess so. The, the last thing I'll say is I'll try to answer some of your questions. If, <laughs> if anyone's keeping track, did I answer any of these questions? Oh, you're, you're going down the list. It's good. <laughs> um, let's see. So the other thing, oh, the last thing I want to say is, so the university, as we all know, is autonomous. We have constitutional autonomy. So as a developer, as, as the builders of this university, and I've looked, as, as, as we went through the renaming exercise, I, I looked back at the history of over 100 years ago, and guys like um, uh, Snyder were, uh, were instrumental in purchasing the land and developing the university into what it is today. And they did it, um, they did it, which is obvious because we can look outside. And there, there, are, a lot of in, there are a lot of cases where, um, for example, we've, um, we've allowed the land to be um, developed. While we owned the land, we didn't necessarily own what was on the land, for example, the, um, the graduate hotel. And in terms of autonomy, I think it gives us an advantage as a university to actually be the, the, the ones who are developing this property. And it's not, I mean, obviously we've developed 29 million square feet. This is 3 million square feet. It's, it's definitely something that the university can do, and we may need some outside partners. But the question of the way that this, this particular deal is structured and um, I would just say that initially when this was presented to us, it was kind of, uh, we'll take, you know, let's swap the land and, and then, you know, we'll, we'll develop what we want to on the land. And I felt that the needs of the university were not being addressed when, when that was brought to us the first time. It says, in fact, in one of the documents, I don't know if this is in the privilege part or not, I don't think it is, it, it said, we will consider developing student housing for you if, if you ask for it. And, you know, I, I, I just think, you know, we're, we're about students here. Uh, we need them. We need to continue to provide a place for them to live, which we have not done a good job of in the last 30 years. We, we changed from a, a commuter campus to a residential campus, but we didn't build that much more housing to house the students, um, which housing has been an issue from, uh, from the beginning of this university um, in various ways. And now the, uh, the cost, total cost of attendance is, is skyrocketed partially because when you add on the housing portion of it, our students are forced to sign leases uh, a year in advance and there, there just is not, you know, I was able to um, go to the Kelly Doran uh, talk in, uh, uh, at the first Tuesday event earlier this uh, this month, and you know he told us he he built 1,500 units. They cost about 130,000 each um, uh, for bed per bed, 
And uh, I think, you know, those were obviously uh, housing units that the university could have developed um, and had the benefit of uh, going forward and trying to keep the prices down. I mean, the, the first Doran prop property was the Sid Sydney Hall property over um, at the Dinky Dome, connected to the Dinky Dome. And um, it's, it's a high-end property. It's got granite countertops and, and all those things. But I think we need to be able to offer affordable student housing, more affordable student housing than, than those types of units. So long story short is I think, I think the university needs to look more carefully at the autonomy and we have to look more carefully at the control uh, and approval process going forward. Thank you, Regent Shu. Now, you've raised uh, a number of good points, including the housing point, which other regents, I think, it's very much on the mind of other regents. And so, President Gable, maybe not, not in intending to try to completely address that, but I know there's work been done on it. And so, President, if you can comment and yeah. maybe some of your experts can help as well on where we've come out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I will say at the outset uh, that any details, um, Mike Bertelson is here who can answer all kinds of questions. But uh, from a, <coughs> excuse me, more 30,000 foot level, absolutely agree that student success and our students are our first priority. There are a variety of ways we serve students. I think this project really serves students, but of course totally agree that we have to have sufficient beds and we have to meet that capacity. We assess this regularly. Um, it is part of ongoing analysis of our financial condition and the way in which we serve students. We have capacity now. We have capacity to grow in a variety of places in a variety of different ways. This land and what's there could be one of them, or we could do it in other places um, that we have identified as possible locations for additional housing. Developing this land in this way does not preclude us from growth for additional beds should the need arise down the road. Okay, thank you, uh, President Gable. Uh, let's move on to Regent Swiggum. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, uh, to my sim very, very simple layperson's eye, um, I would look east of this building, and I think that that project that we're talking about right now has got to be the most underdeveloped, richest property in this city, or if not the most underdeveloped, at least close to it. Uh, I'm very excited about the project, as everybody else is around here. Uh, but Regent Beeson mentioned uh, risk. Uh, and I don't know of anything more risky than real estate development. Real estate is probably as risky as it gets. So I'd ask Ross, if I could, to put on your hat of UMF, and then change your hat and put on your hat of a Regent, the Board of Regents. And just tell me from your assessment, what do you think the risk is of doing this project to both UMF and to the, uh, to the university, to the board? Regent Powell, Regent Swiggum, uh, thank you for asking that. You know, I'm uh, also uh, in the investment business, so, and I have cards available if anyone needs them. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, so from, from, my, from my standpoint, uh, I think the way that, that we proposed the structure and, the, and working with the OGC on this, what we're trying to do actually is have the developers take on the risk rather than the university and rather than the foundation. And so the consequences of that are that the more uh, restrictions and restraints that are put on developers, the fewer the developers that are potentially interested in, and rates of return are gonna be impacted by that. Anything is possible. In, in many ways, but, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the return to the foundation, which will ultimately go to the university, and the risk on the developers. And so that's, that's the way we would, would view that. If the university took on this project, which as, as Regent Chu said they could, the university would, would bear the risk. I also wanna say, and I think this is really important, because I actually think, I, I, you know, sometimes Regent Rocha is so eloquent, I forget that I disagree with him. Um, but <laughs> what he said. That's an affliction my colleagues do not have. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I loved what he said because this is the foundation, uh, fundamental belief that we're operating under. When Regent Rocha, and I'll put it in our terms, your success is our success and your success is our mission. That's exactly right. There's nothing that we are going to do. And for 50 years we've been operating that way. There's nothing that we're going to do that would violate that because that 
to me is, is uh, the fundamental reason this project makes sense. And it's one of the reasons why we believe, from a financial standpoint, the structure that we're proposing makes a lot of sense. So, thank you. Thank you. Good enough. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Regent Schwigeman, and, and thank you, uh, uh, Ross, for, the, for the, those comments. You know, you didn't touch in the presentation on the fact that there is um, financial return to the foundation associated with this. You just mentioned it. You might want to elaborate a bit more for the board on that. And thank you, Chair Powell. Um, again, I will always say we're in early concept uh, phases, but with regard to uh, the return to the foundation, uh, there are a number of ways that we would look to see return, financial return. Um, some of it is going to be over a longer term period of time. Um, as Jennifer and the land transaction principles talk about, uh, the land will always be owned either by the foundation or the university in the entire East, uh, East Gateway District. For the East Gateway project, we see that land being owned by the foundation and us conducting land leases, so ground leases, to the developers. And so we will uh, attract a rate of return on those ground leases. We are also envisioning that we will control the first floor activity. So think about retail, restaurants, um, and becoming really a landlord for that. So there will be lease revenue coming into the foundation for that first floor. Um, above the first floor, that's, as Ross talked about, where the risk of the developers come in and their return uh, for building out uh, the air rights, so to speak, if you think about it. We are in conversations with regard to what would be the right rate of return and that anything above that return that the foundation and those developers could equally share in above uh, the re return that they would need um, take on the risk of building. All right, good. Uh, thank you, President Snoodlecar. Okay, um, uh, Regent Mayron. Um, my reaction is uh, it comes from 30,000 feet on high as well. Uh, I don't have a background in real estate development. Uh, so other than to own a cabin in northwestern Wisconsin, I'm going to talk about that some other time. But in any event, uh, from 30,000 feet high, number one, I'm excited about this project and what it brings to the edge of the university and is a gateway into the university, but is a gateway in compliments and hopefully will positively impact what is going on at the edge of the university and with the surrounding community. And our role with the community uh, is important to me, um, as well as are there clearly what's important is the impact on the university. I find this whole concept to be thrilling, um, that we're involved in and very visionary. What I liked about the land swap is, uh, and if I misunderstood, um, then someone will correct me, but the land swap gives us basically the hook or the uh, seat at the table to really have a say in what this development is gonna look like that we wouldn't otherwise have if we don't do this. This land, is, as I understand it, will get developed by somebody and it either can be a hodgepodge of who knows what will go in uh, and we're seeing some of that uh, happen on the edge of the campus, for example, with the project that is being looked at where McDonald's is, um, that we have no say in at all. This gives us the university a seat at the table and have a say in the direction of this development. And I want a seat at the table as opposed to leaving it to a hodgepodge of developers to come in and um, impact what's on the edge of our university uh, and impacts the community that uh, is at that edge. And I'm hearing, and, and I think that this is being borne out again by the comments by, by the foundation is that, that the financial risk to the university is I'm, I'm not hearing a financial risk to the university. So I'm saying at 30,000 feet high, this is kind of like a no brainer to me. Um, you know, there's no financial risk. It gives us a seat at the table to talk about what this development is gonna look like. It's truly visionary. And so I find it to be exciting. And I do find that the structural pieces that have been uh, proposed um, to address some of the conflict issues and things like that, that we get to address because we're at the table. Um, I'm satisfied that they're uh, um, gonna do what we need to do to protect the university and its interests. So from 30,000 feet high, I'm excited about it. All right, thank you, Region, uh, Region Mayron. Uh, Region Simonson. Thank you, Chair Powell. Uh, project does sound exciting to me. Uh, the idea of 
as uh, Regents Figum talked about, filling that space over there with retail and and uh, um, <clears throat> restaurants, apartments, uh, office space, and the idea of having space even for startups and working maybe with our university, uh, uh, research department. I, I like that thought. Uh, I, I do look forward to uh, more information on, on, on the uh, <clears throat> how we're going to fill those spaces, if you will. Uh, you know, and especially how we're going to coordinate with the start. If there's a plan for the with the uh, startups, how we can advertise that, if you will. The, I'm also looking how the overall governance, you know, proposal on that, and back to these questions that you uh, uh, raised here, uh, uh, Chair Paul. I'm, I'm proposing that the foundation come back to us with some proposed answers to them, uh, rather than us coming up with them. But uh, so overall, governments. Uh, I also like the thought of how this could impact alternative sources of revenue for the university. That's a, that's a big issue for me, and I'd like to see something like that. Uh, the one thing that, uh, and I don't know if this is related or not, but the Chronicle of Higher Education came out with an article a few weeks ago. I don't know if you saw it or not, but it made me think about this project when I read it. It says how a $250 million campus housing deal went bad. An ambitious residential project at the University of Oklahoma has become a cautionary tale about public-private partnerships. I didn't go back into the detail on that, read that, all the stuff on that, but it's something that I think uh, you got to be aware of and, and yeah. say why it doesn't apply. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Simonson. Uh, Regent Kenyana. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, presenters, for uh, this exciting opportunity and everyone who's been involved with it um, before. Uh, also, want to recognize y'all brought quite the crowd here. Um, the only times we have this many people show up is when they're protesting, but. Um, <laughs> you're excited. It, 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 yeah. Is Ezel about to start? I see you. Um, <laughs> Depending on the, how this goes, that might happen. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, I'll get on with it. Um, it, Mr. Ross kind of got out ahead of me on, on one of his recent comments uh, about that risk um, that Regent Beeson brought up, and I think that's an excellent point about where that rests. Earlier in the conversation, the question was brought up, or the statement that the U could develop this, and yeah, probably. I think the better question is, should the U develop it? And um, as we move into that risk conversation, um, I start to think no. And um, yeah, so ju just a couple comments um, quickly on the housing piece. I, I share some of the sentiments that have been shared. Not you know, and there's a difference between a shortage of housing and shortage of affordable housing. I think affordable housing is where we have the shortage. Uh, the Dinikin and, you know, uh, that housing is, 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 a, is a great asset in, um, in terms of being an affordable place. So, so th that's where my concern is, just, just to make sure that we replace it with something else affordable, because there certainly is other private housing available. Um, as I look at page eight on the presentation, uh, it was kind of cool seeing how these other institutions that have done this all have a, an identity of sorts. Yeah, there it is. Um, they all have an identity, and I think that's, that's important and central to, to just bringing the whole project together. Um, and I, I don't know what ours is yet, and there's so many options. If you, if you look at the map with the academic on one side, the, the health sciences on one side, athletics on the other, um, there, there's so many opportunities. So with that, uh, one thing I would love to see in this project is integration um, with campus. Um, certainly, it's, you're, it's going to be different, and you're going to understand you've crossed into East Gateway, but it's got to feel like it's still part of campus, that, you know, it's, it's an extension of campus, not, you know, you cross the street and now you're in a whole different neighborhood, um, and particularly so that, so that, you know, I, I understand that second to whatever floor, businesses and, and this and that and the other thing, but that first floor on the ground floor should be an extension of campus somewhere students feel welcome, um, they can afford the you know, the retail there and so on and so forth. So it can so it, it can integrate with the, the, the academic, the athletic and, and the health sciences on the other side. And then uh, just a last comment, I, I think some of the conversation here is 
is, is a conversation about trust and, and the relationship between the foundation and the university. I think that's what some of this is, is delving into. And, 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 if, and we trust the foundation daily to, to, to do a lot of activities on behalf of the university, and this is an extension of that. Um, if, if there were concerns that the foundation would not act in the university's interests here, which maybe there are, and, and I'm not saying they're unfounded, but if there were, then the bigger conversation is just the relationship and the trust between the two entities, not just the specific projects. Um, but otherwise, uh, thanks for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, thank you, Regent Kenyana, for those, for those comments. Um, so I do have one uh, request for a follow-up from Regent Chu, and then I think I'll do that, and then I, I think everyone else has had a chance to speak, and we'll, we'll wrap it after that, because we do have other business. Oh, okay. So this, uh, Regent McMillan, actually, why don't you go first? I must have talked too much yesterday. <laughs> um, so I want to just go through a couple things that, I mean, use an airplane or our airliner analogy, we've had some 30,000 what comments as a board, we probably belong somewhere in that 10 to 15,000 foot space. I've had the opportunity probably to bring her down to 5,000 on this project, and uh, I don't want to stay there and I won't go there with these comments. But as I think about that mid space and a governance place, there's a lot that I see here that, that, that just stand out to me as key success factors with this. And one of them is the need for planned redevelopment rather than incremental an unplanned um, development of this space, and that's been touched on by a lot, but I think this creates that opportunity to do that right, or at least to do it in a planful manner. I think that we have now that we didn't have a year ago, new and uh, effective governance and oversight mechanisms and parameters, especially as they relate to conflict of interest management, and, uh, and I think the question for the board, not today, but at uh, points in the future is, as that committee gets set up to help UMF um, effectively gather our input into it, that's not necessarily a regent appointment. It might be a regent or determined expert who can do some things like I think about what happened in the medical, uh, you know, the, the, the interview <coughs> space where we had Clint, I forget his last name now, but we had an expert who was responsible to this board to help us understand things that we inherently don't, so I think about that that way, but more importantly, there, I think the place where the question remains is on go-forward input at the governance level, what's there. But I feel much better today than I did a year ago about those governance and oversight mechanisms, especially as they relate to conflict management. This, this theme has been touched on, but gathering private sector capital, so we don't have Brian Burnett using our capital is super critical and not putting our capital at risk. And then, very importantly, and while I respect uh, what Regent Shu and a couple others have said about our ability to develop, I don't want President Gable, on the other hand, to have to develop the expertise it takes to do this stuff right. I, I don't want, and I'm speaking for myself obviously here, but uh, I want Bertelson and his crew to build labs and dorms and classrooms and, and medical innovation districts and all that. Um, discovery districts, I don't want them, I don't want to spend the time and effort and the capital, people capital it'll take to build that expertise here. So I like that about this project. I like to see that the infrastructure replacement costs now are clearly part of the project because we've got IT and storm sewers and being a utility guy, none of that stuff's cheap. It's very, very expensive actually and the commitments there with the university realizing that if we want to you know, triple our broadband capabilities, we they'd pay to get us what we've got today and we'd pay to, to upgrade, which I think, you know, could be an opportunity for us. I don't know. And then, really importantly, before I ask a couple questions and, and uh, Region Kenyanya got to this and several other regions have said it, but this is an opportunity, I think. We think about the foundation every day as our trusted and amazingly talented philanthropic arm of this university. They, they do it every day, what, 360, whatever the number was last year, all-time record. 361. Thank you, 361. <laughs> um, you see, I do listen at the board meetings, even though I've only been <laughs> on at one. On pace That's, again this year. <laughs> um, but we don't, as a board, think as often about this real estate activity. And, you know, it's very, it's very helpful to go back and look at the history. I'm not going to recite it here. 
but with the turnover on this board and the age of that, that Cargill grant, there's a lot of natural reason for why regents would say, well, I don't know, this isn't philanthropy, but it is. I know there's elements of it. And I think this gives us the opportunity with the East Gateway project to push reset on all that and go forward in a very trusting and, and properly delegated fashion. So I'm excited about that. And I think what I'm gonna call the Roche 11 principles of trust and respect are, uh, you know, if we can get to that where we all believe in that, and I, I do, this, is, uh, this has a lot, a lot of promise. Now, here's, here's three areas where I'd like a little more information. And one of them is for our own university leadership team, and I don't need it today. But as we think about the land and the medical, what do we call it, the future clinical campus project, that's a long way away by my understanding. And, and we as a board need to understand what that starts to look like, probably in the 2021, 22, 23 timeframe as we come up against the, the Fairview M Health agreement deadlines, which I know are a little bit further out than that, but we'll be thinking about them. And so I'm able to step back from the housing implications, the affordable housing implications of not having the Cargill properties someday, but to me that sounds like 2025 or later. I don't wanna put it on hold. We need a commitment from this board that we're gonna replace that with, with equally affordable housing. But I can't really evaluate any of that and I'm not that concerned about, about the flip side of this swap Regent Rocha said this earlier, when we need that land, we trust you and we know we'll get it. So to me, I'm not that concerned about the swap. I'm more concerned about President Gable and Dean Tolar and others coming to us and helping unveil what that clinical campus looks like as we start to think, well, okay, if that happens, then when might we not have the Argyle House, whatever. You, it, 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 those pieces start to fall in later, and I believe Regent, Ro Regent Rocha said this as well. So. I don't spend a lot of time on what we get out of the swap. I spend more time thinking about how do we properly put the governance and the, the, the legal contingencies in place to get you our land so you can get going on a development and then as a second or third tier analysis, what do we do when we need a new hospital and what does that mean for student housing? So where's my question in that? It is to our team our medical team and our planning team and our leader of the university and uh, all of those as to what does that time frame look like? So I think that's one of those pieces. Um, the second is, is what, and this is really, I'll, I'll end on this. Help me, President Schmittelkoffer, or past Chair Levin, appreciate the depth of expertise that is part of your UMFREA board. Because I don't, I don't have a good sense of that yet. And when we talk about real estate expertise, you're going to go out and find somebody ultimately to take the place of, of Sarah Harris in that role, and I assume you are. But there's inherent development expertise apart from Visas, isn't there, built into your leadership team? You want to? Yes, uh, Chair Powell, Regent McMillan. <laughs> Uh, You're getting good at this. Uh, you know what? I, I don't want to have a lot of experience with it, frankly. Um, the uh, the uh, expertise of Umphrea Board is is very extensive. I mean, we've got uh, some of the most significant developers in the state that ser that serve on the advisory board, leasing experts, uh, appraisal experts, and so uh, that that board's been curated uh, to have all of these different people who meet regularly and, and care about the university and want to uh, make sure that the university is doing the right thing. So most of the names that, you'll, uh, that you would see on that board, or board are names that you would appreciate. So the expertise is extensive. The support for this project, um, you know, some of the people from the Umphrey board are here right now. The support for this, this project uh, is unanimous from that board. And uh, I, I think that, that you would be very comfortable with, with the people involved with that. One super brief follow-up? Super brief. Um, thank you, Chair Powell. I look, and now for the benefit with, with that answer, um, for the benefit of my colleagues, if you've had the opportunity to serve on our debt management advisory committee or on the investment advisory committee, to me, the model you've got in place over there is a lot like those mm -hmm. because we lean on the private sector to help Stuart Mason and his team invest our money and to help uh, um, to help 
Ryan right. Burnett deal with our debt. So to me, that's the model I think that's about. Great. And yeah. while it isn't, you know, structurally built into all this, that's what you're operating with. And as we capture this new set of governance and oversight mechanisms, I think, you know, broadcast that because you got experts over there and uh, we aren't the experts. So well, there's a couple people, my banking friend here has done everything it feels like, but uh, <laughs> um, I, most of us haven't done real estate development. So enough from me. Thank you very much, Chair Paul. Thank you, Regent McMillan. Regent Shu, could, um, would you be, be as concise as you can? Yes, I, 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 will, yes. I will try. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on that point, I, I would just say the difference in the analogy is that some of these developers, I think, are going to be bidding on the projects, and it's different uh, in debt management and stuff to have experts in securities coming to us. They're not trying to sell us anything. They're just trying to help us make decisions, and so I want to make that point. Um, there were a couple points made about risk. Well, there is risk. There's risk to us because we're the ones that have to pick up the pieces if this falls, falls down, just like um, in the case that uh, at Oklahoma State or Oklahoma. Um, I would say that the university can find partners just like the foundation is finding partners. And I want to be clear that we're not asking university people to develop these buildings. We're just like the Graduate Hotel, which was originally a Radisson. Uh, Radisson came, we own the land, and Radisson came in, and they got a long-term lease on the land. We had a right of first refusal. They built a hotel. And this is no different than that. It's just bigger. And I want to make sure that when people look at this, there's not much difference to things that we have done in the past as a university. In fact, my concern is that the university gets what it needs out of, out of this development. If there's classrooms we, that we need or labs or whatever, the first floor is, is what it is. I mean, there's, there's lots of restaurants over there right now. In fact, they're almost all restaurants. And the last point I want to make is that there, there is property over there that isn't owned by either of us, the foundation or the, um, the university. And um, I'm not sure exactly what the, what the deals are on, on those properties, but you know, once, once this is out there, people are going to say, oh, well, I, I want even more money for my property. And so we've got we've to figure out what we're going to do with that. And I think the university does have some advantages if, if, um, if we were to um, take this project forward. Okay, thank you, uh, Regent Shu. So that, that concludes the discussion today. I want to thank thank the uh, the presenters. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's plenty. You got we had a lot of good discussion, we did. good feedback. We took a lot of good notes. Plenty to follow up on, and uh, I'm sure, sure we'll see you soon. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, we're now moved to our, the, our committee business, beginning with the report of the litigation review co uh, review committee. Uh, Regent Herb, please share your report with us. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the board, the litigation review committee met yesterday, or this morning. We had a huge special meeting yesterday, but we had a committee meeting this morning. And this morning we adopted a resolution that authorized the closing of the meeting to discuss matters subject to attorney-client privileges. There is that report. Thank you, Regent Herb. Next is the Mission Fulfillment Committee. Regent Davenport, please would you share your report? I will share it. I have it. <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> just read it here. Okay. The hand it to me. The hand it to me, Regent Paul. The Mission Fulfillment Committee acted on one item this month. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the consent report, which included new academic programs, changes to academic programs, discontinued academic programs, and the human fetal tissue research report that will be submitted to the Minnesota legislature. I move approval of the consent report. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, okay. Chair Paul. That concludes my report. All right. That motion carries. Thank you. And where are we? Okay. Moving on then to Regent McMillan. Uh, please, will you share the report of the Finance and Operations Committee? I will indeed, Chair Powell. The Finance and Operations Committee acted on one item this month, the revised consent report. The committee separated one item from the report. I'll move the rest of the report and then the separated item. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the remaining items in the revised consent report, which includes Central Reserve's contingency, purchase of goods and services over $1 million, 
dollars and three employment contracts, approval of off-cycle tuition rates, one real estate transaction, a resolution related to issuance of debt, and amendments to the civil service rules. I move approval of those from the committee. There's a motion to approve the what was separate, the, separated from the consent report. Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, to approve all of the, uh, not the separate. Right. All in favor. I have a discussion. Nope. I have a question on one of the consent items. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't know if anybody is here from athletics, but my question basically is I, I reviewed the old contract from Nike, and in, in the old contract, we didn't pay for anything. We just got product. In this new one, we're actually paying 1.4 million. We're getting a little bit more product. So I'm just, I was wondering, you know, I was thinking that, you know, all of our investments in athletics, we would get to a point where Nike would actually pay us some money because I was excited when I first saw that 1.4 million, but then I saw the fact that we're paying the 1.4 million. And um, I was just uh, wondering if uh, there was anything uh, that athletics would say about that, but there's nobody here, so. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it would be better if someone with, from athletics was here to comment, but from uh, 30,000 feet, I will say that when athletics renegotiated this contract with Nike, they brought in consultants to assist them in striking um, what they felt was um, a deal that reflected a, a positive outcome and our position in the market. Also with room to renegotiate in a relatively short period of time with the hope that as our investments start to yield, we will be in a different bargaining position next time around. Thank you. All right, there is a, uh, there is a motion. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, uh, Regent McMillan, would you like to discuss now the separated item? I will. The committee also voted to recommend approval of both the employment agreement with and the appointment of Dr. Rachel Croson as executive vice president and provost. The committee voted on that and eight to four um, moved it forward. So it is before this board as a committee recommendation or a committee motion. Any discussion? Mr. Chair. Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we said a great deal yesterday, so I don't know that there's a whole lot more, but I, I wanted to talk about a couple of things uh, at the end of our managed discussion that had that had come up that that I think bear um, a response. There were a couple of things that were of concern to me. There was a um, a suggestion that that a member or members of the board had uh, revealed information that had been marked privileged and confidential. Now, without going into the question of whether it is privileged information or whether it's simply um, information that was held in confidence until a point in time when it was mandatorily public. Um, I, I would say that that is a, it's a harsh indictment. And if a member, and well, and for one, the, the speaker at the time, and I had spoken about this issue the previous week, and I had explained certainly from my perspective, because that was where the implication was, I was directly asked. I pointed out that it was very clearly that that was not the case, that, um, I certainly had waited until information was public before I had any dialogue uh, with anybody outside of the board. And the fact that that was, was posed yesterday, I, I find to be troublesome. And if, if the member believes that that's an issue, I would ask that the member ask for an inquiry so that we can address it. Otherwise, I don't think that has a place uh, in our conversation. Secondly, um, there, was a, there was a representation of, of, of the view of, I understand legislators had signed a letter and that one of the legislators had questioned whether or not they should um, whether or not they should have signed the letter. Now, I don't speak to the letter. I don't speak to the individual's um, the intents and so on. But if you're going to represent someone's position, particularly if they've taken one in writing, name them and provide verification of it. I think it. I don't think it's appropriate for the debate um, to, to use that device. And then finally, um, there was somewhat of a surprising suggestion that that. Um, the, de the determination about the compensation rate was a gendered issue. And I would point out that the only way you could, could make that assessment is, first of all, having a discussion of comparative backgrounds, and that's not relevant here. I think we all accept the fact that we're dealing with very talented people. But you would have to have agreed that the Madison rate was a rate you would support. And if you wouldn't support the Madison rate, then certainly there would be no gender component in your raising questions about about the rates that we have here. But, but the, in, the insinuation that any member of this board was making a decision based on, on that issue, I, I think, um, is not 
appropriate for the, the candidate, nor is it appropriate for our colleagues. And I, I just raise that, that concern. And then um, I, I believe we should discuss these matters on the merits. And when somebody articulates their position as supporting the president, it creates an environment that, that prevents an honest and open debate when a matter calls for our discretion, when it's specifically left to us, to suggest that any disagreement would imply not being supportive of the president shifts, it shifts a dynamic. Um, matters of significant policy, we have a very talented president who makes positions to us and we then um, pass our judgment. And it's, it's at that point the president's very capable responsibility then to ensure that we come along. And certainly members of this board have a right to reach a different conclusion. And if they do so, I, I, think, it's, I, I think it's below the board to suggest that that would not be supportive of the president. It would just simply reflect the fact that there's a reason there are 12 of us with all of our different backgrounds and experiences. Finally, the question was posed as to whether we're helping the university or hurting the university. And leaving all the implications of this specific decision aside, I'll just offer a glimpse of the future. First, we raise compensation for a limited number of folks for a variety of justifications. And then the legislature takes the signal that we have adequate resources and they direct state money away from the university for other critical state needs. To make up the gap, we raise tuition. This leads to less support from the state while compensation for certain personnel is continuing to rise. And this is a positive feedback loop that we've seen now for a couple of decades and college becomes less affordable and public support wanes uh, as, a, as a result. So we can revisit this in 20 years. We'll see if I'm right. Uh, but, but to that extent, I look forward to Dr. Crozen's arrival on campus. I hope we have an opportunity to meet and interact with her um, and uh, look forward to her being everything that she's been uh, described as as we move into our critical strategic planning process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you for those, thank you for those comments, uh, Regent Rocha, uh, Regent Swigum. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the members, uh, very, very quickly, and to my friend, my colleague to the right uh, over here, uh, uh, Regent Rocha, all five comments you made were specifically uh, addressed and attached to comments I made yesterday, specifically all five of them I did make. I want to tell you very honestly and very respectfully, I stand by the comments I made and the exact words I made them in. Okay, any other um, discussion? Any, any other, any, okay, guys. <laughs> any other discussion on the separated motion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Thank you. Motion carries. Uh, Regent McMillan, any other business from the Finance and Operations Committee? That concludes my report. All right, thank you. Regent Mehron, the report of the Governance and Policy Committee, please. Thank you, Chair Powell. The Governance and Policy Committee met today uh, and did not consider any action items this month. That concludes my report. Thank you, Chair Powell. Thank you very much. That brings us to old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? All right. Well, I, I have one item of new business that we just learned about uh, regarding the Shriners property. This is an update. I want to make sure the board's informed. And I will now invite Senior Vice President Brian Burnett and Assistant Vice President Leslie Kruger to join us at the presenter's table. Senior Vice President Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. As you know, you gave us authority in October to pursue the purchase of the Shriners Hospital property down on East River Road. And since that time, um, Leslie, has, Leslie, Assistant Vice President Kruger, has been working diligently on, because the close date is coming near. Um, the, the good news is uh, we have a more favorable deal to report that she uh, can talk about in high terms, but we don't have it in writing yet. We have some agreements in terms, and we just wanted to make the board aware that we're going to uh, work hard to bring it down below the authority that the board brought us. And with that, I'd like Assistant Vice President Kruger to explain. Thank Assistant you, Vice Chair President Paul, Kruger. members of the board. Uh, this is late breaking news that as uh, Senior Vice President Burnett was stating, we have been working with Shriners Hospital and completing our due diligence over the last several months. And the due diligence period was scheduled to expire on December 9th. 
we were still finalizing some of the negotiations, and so we agreed to a 15-day amendment to the or extension of the due diligence period. And in this time period, we have been continuing to go back and forth with uh, our colleagues at Shriners related to our findings of the facilities condition assessment, as well as the lease negotiations. And so you'll recall that as we when we presented this, that we were doing the due diligence. We did find some issues related to the fact that this was an aging building, and we knew going in that there would be some mechanical and infrastructure issues that we would need to attend to as part of the renovation project. And so as a result, we are in process of negotiation, and as Senior Vice President Burnett uh, stated that this has not been signed as of yet, but uh, as a result of the facilities condition assessment as well as those leaseback negotiations that we are considering a lower purchase price in exchange for a nominal rent during the time of the initial term of the leaseback. And so the leaseback, uh, according to the purchase agreement, would allow Shriners to continue to occupy the space until end of July 2020 while they're finishing up their uh, construction of their new facility in Woodbury and that in, during that time period they would lease back the facility to us for a $1 in exchange for a lower purchase price. And so we're uh, happy with this, uh, these new deal terms because of the fact that this will allow us to put additional resources to the renovation project. Uh, in, in the form of some of these facilities condition related issues that we are able to uh, attend to now rather than at a later date. And so I think this is a great um, opportunity for us uh, to allow for those uh, facilities condition issue, issues to be attended to and allow for a ground lease of the facility so that they are in control of the entire facility during that lease back and we're not uh, going back and forth with them over a leased premises or who's managing what. Thank you, um, Assistant Vice President. Um, can, can you maybe summarize for us um, with the um, additional mechanicals work that, we're, we're, that will have to be addressed uh, and the more favorable terms, is it a net neutral for us? Or maybe you can let us give us a summary for where you think we land. Um, it's a, I believe it's a net benefit for us. And so from the standpoint of um, the initial purchase agreement, which was uh, not negotiated by the university, we, assu we assumed this purchase agreement that we were, um, that the building, um, reckon we recognized that there were issues with the, with the mechanicals. They were the, exist the original mechanicals for the facility. And so we knew that going in. And so as we were looking at the facility's condition assessment, there were definitely uh, issues that we knew going in and that were embedded into the purchase price. There were additional issues that we, as we did the detailed analysis, uh, that we determined that were, um, that were points of contention that we went back to Shriners and said, you know, these are things that, uh, and, and as you were buying, if you were buying a home and doing your home inspection, there were certain things that were disclosed to us and we knew up front, and there were other things that were discovered during that inspection process that we'd like the, uh, the seller to address or to be um, share in those costs with us. And so we've been back and forth with them on that. And uh, in, in exchange, allowing for this addressing the lease back provision at that same time, it does become a net benefit for us and it allows for us to address a whole host of issues uh, in, a, uh, in, a very, in a simplified way of getting the deal done and uh, really a win-win for everybody. Okay, so I'm very, very good. Um, and so this is, an inf this is information for us today, there's no action and you no. continue to operate within the parameters that we set Yes. So this is this is strictly information. Any questions from anyone on the board for our two presenters? Okay, thank you thank for you. that report. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, any other new business to come before the board? All right. Hearing none. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. We're adjourned.